revise 10 reasons why eternal security is true? No actually realistically and biblically it should be, 10 reasons why eternal security is not true. This is another example of Matt Powell trying to promote his false doctrine, though sincerity may be observed, he is still wrong. Refuting these 10 reasons is very easy. I will show you how easy it is. Let's begin. Number one, because Jesus gives us eternal life. What does eternal mean? It means everlasting. It means that it never ends. And so if Jesus tells us that he that believeth on him hath everlasting life, that means that you possess eternal life in the spiritual realm. And that no matter what, you cannot have that life be terminated. And so if you had eternal life today and you lost it tomorrow, that did not last forever. That's a lie. John 6 44, 47 No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. People want to use this phrase, hath everlasting life to me now in this life. But you have to look at other passages with the words everlasting or eternal life. If we have it now in this life then why did Paul write this? Romans 6 22-23 But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we have eternal life now, then why did Paul write that eternal life comes at the end? Are there two eternal lives, as in different versions of it? So he's going to give us eternal life now, but then give it to us again later? Is there an expiration date on this life's eternal life? If that's the case, then it can't be called eternal or everlasting life. It's amazing that I used to be naive enough to believe the word, hath, always means present tense, as in I possess it now. That's not true. When do we get eternal life? At the end in the world to come. Jesus said so. Mark 10 17-30. Now this passage is the same scenario as in Matthew 19 16-26 and Luke 18 18-27. But see these verses in Mark 10, verse 29 And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the Gospels, no man had done this because nobody had received the Gospel in the Old Testament. How can they follow something they didn't understand or accept? Was Christ lying? No. Verse 30 But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. Wow, Christ just separated now in this life and in the future. 1. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, notice he didn't say riches or wealth. So that annihilates the prosperity gospel. 2. And in the world to come eternal life. What's the world to come? After death. Isn't God's kingdom a world in of itself? Yes. See John 18 36, Revelation 11 15. Christ said his kingdom is not of this world. That means there's another world of great power and perfection. God's kingdom. If it's in the world to come, future, then how can you have it now? Christ clearly used that terminology. Matt says, no matter what, you cannot have that life terminated. There's only two ways to consistently believe in this. First, you have a license to sin, which means you can live in sin as much as you want and God cannot do anything about it. He also has no power or authority to punish you. Because the whole belief of once saved always saved hinges on, if he can erase all of your past present and future sins, he no longer sees them. So how can he punish you for a sins he cannot see? Second, it means you are a mindless robot with no freedom of expression, which also means no free will. Those are the only options you have. I even asked Matt Powell this and he chose the first option. He believes you have a license to sin. What a hypocrite he is. The second reason why eternal security is true is because Jesus says to those who are damned on judgment day that I never knew you. So if you go to hell, that means that you were never in the family of God to begin with. He didn't say, I used to know you and you lost it. I knew you once, but you fell away. He didn't say, I don't know you anymore. He says that if you go to hell, I never knew you. So that means that those who are damned on judgment day are not people that got saved and lost it. It's the many that will say, Lord, Lord, we've done many wonderful works in your name and they're trusting in their works. And Jesus says, I never knew you to them. Not true. Matthew 7 22-23 Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? 
and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. A common misinterpretation of this verse is, Christ said I never knew you. He didn't say I once knew you and then you walked away. I'll give you a hint. It helps if you read the surrounding verses to understand the context, Matthew 7 19 Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, and cast into the fire. But according to once saved always saved, it doesn't matter if we have fruit in this life or not because we can't lose our salvation. That's not what Jesus said. But then they want to yell back, well the verse says no good fruit is cast into the fire and that's trying our works. But we are saved by fire according to 1 Corinthians 3 15. Not true. Matthew 7 20-22 Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? Christ said many, he didn't say all the lost. He's making a point that there will be many people who will try to talk Christ into letting them into his kingdom bribery in other words. Verse 24 Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, how about Ezekiel 18? All these verses listed soon will annihilate this eternal security belief. Now before you get all hostile and start yelling, that's Old Testament, calm down and read them. See verses 20, 24, 26. But you say, these verses say is righteousness. In the Old Testament they had their own righteousness by the law. But now we get Jesus Christ's righteousness. Yes you're correct. But that's completely irrelevant to how God sees somebody at their present state when they stand before Him. But read on and be patient. The Book of Life. If certain people are not found written in the Book of Life, can God claim to never know someone regardless if they were in the Book of Life but then were blotted out? Yes. God's method of whether He knows someone or not has not changed because that has to do with His nature. Malachi 3 6 For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So does God have the right from these passages, especially Ezekiel 18, 24, 26, to declare to have never known somebody if they die in their sins and God deletes their past possible walk with Christ before they fell away? Yes He does. Ecclesiastes 7 8 Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Does God change in how He deals with their judgment at the great white throne? No, because He will judge all the same way when we all stand before Him to be judged at the final judgment in Revelation 20. There's not two separate judgments, one for the saints and one for the lost. Lastly under this point, the common illogical nonsense blunder that people commit by this belief is His statement that basically, if He says, I never knew you, that means you were never in a family of God to begin with. That's nonsense. Parable. I go to the bank and I apply for a loan and obtain it. In the middle of the loan payments I call the bank and I ask them, what if I refuse to make the remainder payments of my debt? And they say, well then that just proves you never had a loan to begin with because I never knew you obtaining a loan from us. If I tell you I never knew you in record of obtaining a loan from us that means you never obtained a loan to begin with. Does that make any sense? No. Is that realistic? No. And the third reason that you can't lose your salvation is that you could never lose by bad works that which you could never obtain by good works. Think about it. The Bible says, if it be of grace, then it is no more work, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of work, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Salvation is either by faith or works. The Bible goes on to say, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's to him that worketh not, but trusts in Christ. It's to him that humbles himself and realizes that he's a sinner in need of a Savior. That's the person that God's going to save. Not true. Romans 11 6 And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What does Paul mean by this verse? You can't conclude that Paul is teaching salvation without works. Also, you cannot say that grace is not earned according to this verse. We know that nobody can atone for their past by works. It is by faith in Christ only by grace. Also grace has always been the saving factor that saved man. Works have nothing to do with the end result of saving us. It is grace and faith in Christ only. Now to obtain that grace, we must believe on Him and keep the commandments, works. That's the only way to biblically explain this verse. Romans 4 4 5 Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, 
his faith is counted for righteousness. The key words are, reward and debt. Reward and debt are the result of something. Work is something you do to pay off or to diminish a past obligation because debt is the result of a past issue. Grace is something you ask for and you go towards to receive it. Paul compares debt, work, to believing, not working, and explains that if you believe on Him, God, that justifies the ungodly your faith is counted for righteousness. Again, keep in mind the context is the result of what Paul explained in the previous chapter that it's about your past. That's why the word, debt, appears in verse 4. You can't do anything about your sin debt past because it's already there. There's nothing you can do to pay that off. You have to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all of your past debt of sin and give you a brand new beginning, which is what chapter 6 is all about. Do you see how easy it is to refute Matt Powell's heretical nonsense? The whole belief of once saved always saved proves that God is not just, righteous, holy, and cannot hold us accountable for any sins we commit on this planet. However if we can lose our salvation that proves that God is consistently just, righteous, holy, and will hold us accountable for our sins. The fourth reason why you cannot lose your salvation is because we've been born again. The Bible says that you've been born of incorruptible seed by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So if we are born of incorruptible seed, number one, that seed cannot be corrupted because it's incorruptible. Number two, if you're born, you cannot be unborn. That's not true. 1 Peter 1 23 being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How can someone be born again fully now if all we have is the incorruptible seed? Where's our physical body? Guess what? We get it at the resurrection. See 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20. Even Christ and Nicodemus knew it's a literal physical birth regarding getting our new body. See John 3 1-6 also known as the word, being, born again. Being, is a process word. Being, is a continual process and not finalized yet. If I say, this envelope is being mailed, has it reached its destination yet? No. Also the concept belief of once saved always saved is the idea that we are fully born again in this life, as in we are completed and do not need development, maturity, or growth. Is that true? No, that's nonsense. You can build a house and say the house is completed because you built the actual physical structure. Does that mean there's no development or improvements to be done to the house to make it more of a home for a family? No. Since being born again does not mean we are fully completed in Christ on this earth, especially since we still have our sinful nature and will die a physical death because of sin, then obviously the incorruptible seed, which is conception of the Holy Ghost of our new birth, doesn't mean that the incredible seed can never be removed or erased. The Holy Ghost came upon people and left them like King Saul for example. He never came back. Just because we are born, conceived of the Holy Spirit spiritually, doesn't mean the incorruptible seed will always be there and never be removed. Just like the Holy Spirit is incorruptible, correct? So in the Old Testament he was upon King Saul, but then was removed. So that's proof that something incorruptible, like the Holy Spirit, can be removed. Lastly, the stupid argument that because you were born it means you can never be unborn, is ridiculous. This argument is relating it to a physical birth on earth. Obviously a baby that is physically born cannot be unborn. That is completely irrelevant to the spiritual new birth that happens when we are conceived by the Holy Spirit in the new birth. That's what the new birth is. The Holy Spirit confirms the new birth. It's not this magical spell or some sort of sorcery that Jesus does or a feeling that takes place. It's the Holy Spirit that comes upon us and is the cause and effect of our new birth. If the Holy Spirit leaves then that new birth is now forfeit. People forget that. Also along with this, Matt Powell erroneously believes that we have God's DNA flowing through us, and therefore he believes that we were born again physically into God's family. That's false. We were adopted into God's family, not directly born into it. A child who is adopted can rightly say that he is born again into a new family. Is that a physical birth or spiritual birth? It's a spiritual thing. We are adopted into God's family by a spiritual new birth by the Holy Spirit. That's what it is it's not a physical thing on earth. So this argument, that you can never be unborn if you are born, is ridiculous and has no relevance whatsoever. I already made a video refuting this whole idea. So I won't list all of the evidence from scripture for the sake of space and time. And the fifth reason why you can't lose your salvation is because Jesus said he will never leave us or forsake us. That's powerful. Jesus holds on to his children. He doesn't abandon his children. God is a good father. And Jesus said in the book of John that him that cometh to me I will in no 
wise cast out. That means in no wise, no matter what, he will not cast them out. Why? Because God is a good father. Not true. Hebrews 13 5 Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Is Paul writing to rebels or saints in the body of Christ? The answer is obvious. Why would he tell sinners this who said a sinner's prayer and profess they were still saved? T. Hay failed to see this passage. Hebrews 6 4-6 For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. 2 Corinthians seven ten For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Also see Hebrews 2 3, 3 to 6 to 15, 6 to 4 to 12. John 6 37 All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Wait a minute. Let's look at that in detail. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. I thought they already came to Jesus. Not so. All that the Father giveth me, is referring to the foreknowledge of God. For example if I said, all the fruit that my wife gives me shall come to me, does that mean they already arrive to me? No it doesn't. I'm stating this according to the foreknowledge of what my wife told me previously of what she was going to buy me on the grocery list. If she said she's going to buy me fruit, then I can say that all the fruit my wife gives me shall come to me. Next. And in that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So now we understand what the latter part of this verse is saying. It's a future tense phrase. If this verse is implying for this life as the application, then we can conclude that it doesn't matter how we live. He'll never cast us out in this life, no matter what we do or what we say. I'll add this as a side note. Jesus will never have to cast you out. The false converts will walk out and walk away. There are two types of false converts. 1. The first are those who never truly believed from the heart. They made a professing belief with their mouth, but their heart was always far from him. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They are fake. 2. The other kind of false convert are those that truly believe from the heart. But then after a while they fall away. Read the parable of the sower and the seed. Luke 8 13. Read John 6 60-71. The crowds that believed on him and followed after him, walked away after they were offended by the truth. And what does he mean by, that cometh to me? To come to Christ is to believe. See John 5 24, 6 35, Hebrews 11 6. Therefore we come to Christ by faith when we believe on Him. See Ephesians 4:13, Hebrews 11:6. And the sixth reason why you can't lose your salvation is because it would make Jesus a liar. Jesus said in John 5:24 that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's life that goes forever, so you possess it in the present, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. So Jesus said. Once you're saved, you shall not ever come into condemnation. You will not be condemned. But you've been passed from death unto life. What kind of life are we talking about? We're talking about eternal life. In that moment, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when you receive eternal life. It's not when you've committed your life to Christ. It's not when you've turned from every sin, turned over a new leaf, given up your old paths, and followed Christ. You should give up your old things, and you should follow Christ. You should give up your sins, but that's not a requirement for salvation. My friend, the only way to be saved is by looking to the cross, trusting Christ alone. You shouldn't put your trust in, oh, well, I quit smoking. Some people say, well, I quit drinking, and I trusted in Christ. No, that's not going to get you to heaven. The only thing that gets you to heaven is trusting Jesus alone. Jesus said, unless you come to me as a little child, you shall not in any wise inherit the kingdom of heaven. People who say they can lose their salvation, they're calling Jesus a liar when he said that you shall not be condemned. He prophesied that no matter what, you cannot lose your salvation and that it is a gift of eternal life. If I offered somebody this iPhone and I said, hey, this is an everlasting iPhone, it's got 10% but it never will die. It will never go below 10%. And I gave it to somebody, and it died. That wasn't an everlasting iPhone. That makes me a liar for saying that it's everlasting. When Jesus gives you eternal life, think about this. When Jesus gives you the gift of everlasting redemption, that is a gift that lasts forever by definition of what salvation even is. That's BS. 
John 5 24 Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. But is passed from death unto life. People want to quickly shout, it says is passed, that means we have it now. Wrong. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans 6. Read the entire chapter. Paul never said in that chapter that we have eternal life right now. He mentioned it in verse 23 as the end result. But we have now a new life walk in Christ. Walking away from our past of sin and walking in newness of life in Christ. Also people want to conclude that to believe only means a faith feeling in the heart and no works necessary. But that would be contrary to what Paul wrote, resulting in a factual contradiction between Jesus and Paul. Matt says, Jesus said once you're saved you shall not ever come into condemnation. Eternal life in that moment when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when you get eternal life. The only way to be saved is looking to the cross and trusting Christ alone. Not true. John 5 24 Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Quick logical explanation. Notice the verse said he will not come into condemnation. It did not say, shall never come to condemnation. Not and never, are not the same thing. For example, if a mother said to her child, if you do not complete the chores in this house you will not go play with your friends outside. Does that mean he will never play with his friends outside ever again? No. She said, not, as in regarding that circumstance. Proof why Jesus is not teaching once saved always saved. 1. Apply the law of elimination. It doesn't say, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation in this time or life. See Mark 10 30. 2. The later verses 25 to 29 prove it. Verse 25, the dead shall hear the voice of God. Verse 28, those that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Verse 29, done good, resurrection of life, done evil, resurrection of damnation. That happens at the end, Revelation 20 11 to 15. 3. Paul never contradicted Christ. In Romans 6 Paul simply teaches it's at the end to get eternal life. Verse 21, bad fruit the end of those things is death. Verse 22, fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, wages of sin is death, gift of God is eternal life. Both are at the end, verses 21 to 22. Paul confirms what Christ said in Mark 10 30. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. John 5 24 does not teach we have eternal life right now. And passing from death until life is two applications. First is the application that we passed from death unto life as a new walk life with Christ. Being dead in our trespasses of sin from our past, now we are alive in Christ and walking in newness of life. The second application is we are passed from death unto life and that we get eternal life at the end. And the seventh reason why you cannot lose your salvation is because you are sealed to the day of redemption once you believe. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. And we're sealed by God. That's a seal that cannot be broken. You ever thought about the verse in the Bible that says that God left the ninety and nine, that Jesus would leave the ninety and nine to go for one sheep that went astray. And he would bring that sheep back into his fold. That's how much he loves us. This is false. Ephesians 1 13 to 14 in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Does it say the promise seal cannot be broken? No it does not. So it's wrong to interpret it as such. Also if it's part of our inheritance until the redemption, then obviously we have not received the inheritance yet. So how can we have eternal life right now just because it says we are sealed? That makes no sense. Next passage. Ephesians 4 30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Just because it says we are sealed until the day of redemption, does not mean the seal cannot be broken. You can look at any envelope and claim it is sealed until the time of its destination. Does that mean the envelope is indestructible? No. Also if once saved always saved is true, then why does Paul even bother giving commandments to basically put off the sins of the flesh and live in the Spirit? See verses 22 to 32. What if I don't want to live in the Spirit and would rather live after the flesh? What is God going to do to me? 
This is where once saved always saved people will say that God will punish you in this life. Do you really think anybody in their right mind is going to care if they are going to have any way? No. Also according to once saved always saved, God cannot punish you because whenever He sees you He always sees His Son Jesus Christ. If that's true then there's no way He can ever see your sin. Therefore He cannot judge you for sins He cannot see and which He already forgave. Next passage. Hebrews 12 6 For whom the Lord loveth He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. People only want to quote this one verse, but they reject the surrounding verses in context. See verses 7-8, 15-17, 25-29. Read them very carefully. If I am always going to be his child no matter what, then it is pointless for him to punish me because he already forgave all of my sins anyways. Lastly, under this point he quotes. Luke 15 4 What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? This has no relevance at all to his belief of once saved always saved. Yes Jesus may go out and look for you if you wander away, but that doesn't mean he's going to keep you saved no matter what. If you're saved no matter what, then it's pointless for him to go looking for you. It doesn't matter if you wander away or not. This is contrary to once saved always saved. It's very evident that he's endorsing slavery. If it's a permanent salvation and we're not going anywhere no matter what, then we have no free will. God's going to force us into heaven against our will. How is that love? It isn't. It's slavery. 1 Peter 1 5 Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice, He only quotes this verse, but he ignores the rest in context. This is what cherry pickers do, which Matt Powell is. Only choosing data or evidence that agrees with their conclusion, while ignoring the rest that will clearly refute their conclusion. Quickly examining this verse, just because it says we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, doesn't mean he does that against our will. Again, that's endorsing slavery if you believe otherwise. Also, pay attention, It says kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If this salvation is ready to be revealed, then obviously we have not obtained it yet. There are two stages of salvation. We are saved from our past, Ephesians 2 8-9, and we are saved in the future when we abide in Christ enduring unto the end to be saved, Matthew chapter 10. Just an accident? No. Now these other verses that he so craftily and sneakily avoided. That crafty lying slithering snake. Verse 9 Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. The end of our faith? According to Matt Powell we received eternal life right now of salvation for our souls. Not according to Peter. So who are you going to believe, Peter or Matt Powell? I choose scripture, as Paul said in Romans 3 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Verse 13 Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you? Why do we need to hope to the end for that grace? I thought we received God's full grace now? Not necessarily. We have grace through Christ to get through this life by abiding in Christ enduring unto the end. The grace at the end to be brought unto us at the revelation of Jesus Christ, hint, that's the end, is the completion of our salvation verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If once saved always saved is true, then what difference does it make if I conduct myself as obedient children, being holy because God is holy? It doesn't matter. According to once saved always saved, I can live however I want and still go to heaven. Verse 23 Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This is the verse false teaching heretics, like Matt Powell, will bring up. Notice the word, being, appears again. It's a process. If I have the full incorruptible seed by the word of God right now, full and complete with no need of development or maturity, then why did Peter write in their previous verses to be as obedient children and be holy as God is holy? That doesn't make sense. I do have the incorruptible seed by the Word of God that abides forever, but does that mean, as discussed before by evidence and proof, that it can never be taken away? No. As the Holy Spirit, who is incredible and perfect, could be removed from King Saul for example, so can the incorruptible seed be removed as well. Next passage. John 10 28 And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I give unto them eternal life. He did not say, 
I give unto them eternal life now in this life. So it is irresponsible to conclude that He gave it to us right now according to this verse, because He never said that. And they shall never perish what does He mean by the word, perish? If you believe He means spiritually we shall never perish, then that means according to the once saved always saved belief, we will never lose that eternal spiritual salvation, no matter what happens. Therefore, I can live however I want because my salvation is secure. You cannot put a condition on eternal life. God cannot give something eternal to you and then take it away. That would be like telling somebody that they have unlimited money in their bank account, but then putting an expiration date on it. Therefore if I will never spiritually perish starting now in this life, then it doesn't matter how I live because he did not say in this verse that I have to live a certain way. That means I don't have to fear God, keep commandments, love my neighbor because I don't have to. Verse 29 My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Again, since eternal life is eternal, then no man can take it from me, even if I want them to. Therefore it doesn't matter what sinful influences I have in my life because they will never affect my eternal life state. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That's interesting because Jesus did not say, no sin is able to pluck them out of my hand. People add assertions to texts that doesn't say what they think it says. It is true that nobody can force us out of the Father's hand. We have to be willing to jump out of the Father's hand ourselves. If people claim that we are unable to walk out of the Father's hand, then that means I have no free will. So I couldn't choose sin if I wanted to. Which means I'm a mindless robot. If that's the case, then why does Paul waste his time writing in his letters for us to keep ourselves from the flesh and the world and in giving commandments to keep? Parable. If I'm in my car and I said, no man is able to pluck me out of my car, does that mean I don't have the ability to get out of the car either? No, that's nonsense. God doesn't mean that. You have to accept Jesus as He stated it. Nobody can force you out of salvation in Christ. You have to choose that yourself. If it's true that I cannot walk out of Christ or the Father's hand, then Jesus contradicted Himself five chapters later. John 15 6, 10 If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. He uses the word, if, a conditional word. If, conditional, we do not abide in Him we are task force as a branch and shall be gathered and cast into the fire. How do you explain that? Says nothing about trying our deeds or works. It's us. It's a permanent salvation? You're not going anywhere? Not according to Jesus Christ. Looks like Matt Powell has been soaking his head reading a bunch of commentaries and listening to what preachers' opinions are about these passages that he claims teaches once saved always saved. He surely does not believe the words of Jesus Christ, which makes him not a biblical follower of Jesus Christ. And the ninth reason that you cannot lose your salvation is because the blood of Christ, if it's powerful enough to save you and to take away your past sins, it's powerful enough to keep you saved. Now, it's an attack on the blood of Christ when people say that Jesus did not pay for sins, past, present, and future. The Bible says he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says that Christ died for the ungodly. That means that he died for everybody, that he died for every sin that will ever be committed and that ever has been committed. The blood of Christ is under attack today. Many people think that there's different ways to get to heaven. No, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And he was lifted up on a cross. And it was the blood that came streaming down off that cross that justifies you and I. And it's what makes us holy before God. I do not deny the power of Jesus Christ in his shed blood. But that doesn't mean it's going to keep you safe against your will, which is what Matt Powell believes. That's endorsing slavery. I could very well say, well if God is all-powerful and if He's strong enough, He can make everybody go to heaven and save all of us. Does that mean He's going to do it against our will? No. Secondly, it is not an attack on the blood of Christ because Jesus did not pay for anything on the cross, especially anybody's past present and future. The Bible does not say this or teach it. Matt Powell is a liar. These have nothing to do with proving once saved always saved. No relevance, especially if you read the context. I already explained 1 Peter 1 5, but Romans 5 6 has no relevance to keeping us saved against our will. 1 Peter 1 5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Romans 5 6 for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Matt Powell is losing ground here. 
the tenth reason why you cannot lose your salvation is because God has made a covenant with himself to keep those who are saved, saved until the day of redemption. And my favorite verses in the Bible on eternal security is found in Psalm 89. This is in the Old Testament where the Bible says, If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So God said in verse 34, he says, my covenant will I not break. He says he's not going to break the covenant. You may break the covenant. In those earlier verses, it says that people turned their back on God that were saved. They committed sin. They committed iniquity. But what did God do? He didn't send them to hell. He didn't cast them out. He corrected them. He says, I will punish their iniquity. He says, I will correct my children. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. People that believe you can lose it, they'll always say, well, as long as you believe in Jesus at the last moment, as long as you've turned from your sins in the last moment, then God will take you to heaven. I know of people in the Bible that died in sin, that committed suicide, but they are in heaven. Where has he made a covenant with himself to keep people saved against their will? Nowhere. Psalms 89 30-34 If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless my love and kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. The context is speaking of David's children, not David himself because David cannot control what his children do after him. The context is in verse 33 that God will not break his covenant with him, David. This is because in God's foreknowledge God knew that David was going to endure unto the end. Context 3-4, 20, 28-29. I have made a covenant with my chosen, I have sworn unto David my servant, thy seat will I establish forever, and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. The context is clearly with David personally. God knew that David was a man after God's heart. Yes God knew that David sinned and messed things up. But he got right with God near the end of his life. His other passage. Hebrews 12 6 For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. People only want to quote this one verse but they reject the surrounding verses in context, 7-8, 15-17. 25 to 29. Read them very carefully. If I am always going to be his child no matter what, then it is pointless for him to punish me because he already forgave all of my sins anyways. His blunder conclusions. Jesus' blood was enough to save them and to keep them saved. Jesus' blood was enough to keep Samson saved after he committed suicide. Jesus' blood was enough to keep Saul, King Saul, in the Bible, who died on his own sword. The Bible says the Holy Spirit departed from him, God became his enemy. But the Bible tells us King Saul is in heaven right now. Why? Because of the blood of the Lamb. You know, when they were crossing through the Red Sea, they only had to cross through it once, and they were saved. When the children of Israel applied the blood to the doorpost of their house so that the death angel could pass over them, you know how many times they applied that blood? Once. You know how many times Jesus died on the cross? Once. And Jesus said, if you believe on him, that you'll never hunger and never thirst. That's a one-time thing. He says he's the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. When you come to Jesus Christ, when you receive the bread of life, you will never hunger again. It's a one-time thing. Just as we see one-time examples throughout the Bible. You think God's trying to tell you something? Salvation, redemption, happens once. You're born once. You receive eternal life once. You don't have to get saved and then unsaved, saved and then unsaved. Born, unborn, everlasting life, temporary life. And the reason that people hate this message that I'm sharing is because it incriminates their false gospel. It incriminates, and the blood of Christ is so powerful that it shines light on people that think that they're so good, but they're really not. 
I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of sins I've never committed. But I know that the Bible says that if you've committed one sin, that you're guilty of all. Getting to heaven has never been about our goodness. It's always been about Jesus' goodness. Getting to heaven has never been about our ability to endure and keep our salvation. It's about his ability to keep us saved and secured in his hand. Salvation's never been about our commitments. Look, Jesus was the one who was committed to the cross, to living sinlessly. Salvation's never been about our goodness and our works. It was always about his work. He said it's finished. You can't add to it and you can't take away from it. And you will incur the wrath of God on your life and the wrath of the Lamb if you hear this message and you reject it and you say, nope, I'm going to keep my own salvation. I'm going to make sure I don't turn my back on God so he doesn't turn his back on me. People get offended whenever I speak about eternal salvation and tell them that Jesus paid it all and that all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. I didn't wash it white as snow by turning over a new leaf, doing all these good things. It sounds real logical until you read in the Bible where God said that there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Did you know that the Bible says that? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is not a just man. A saved man. There's not a saved man, a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. All of us are with sin. We all have to battle with sin. A lot of people say, Matt, I'm going to heaven because I'm enduring. I've repented of every sin I've ever done. I've turned over a new leaf. Look, the Bible actually says that he that thinketh he standeth, let him take heed lest he fall. With all that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video and that you got something out of it. And that if you're not saved, that you trust Jesus to take you to heaven. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved, shall be saved. It's the promise of God. The Bible says, and this is the promise which he hath promised us, even eternal life. One, Jesus' blood was enough to keep Saul king in the Bible who died on his own sword. The Bible says the Holy Spirit departed from him and God became his enemy. But the Bible tells us King Saul is in heaven right now. No it doesn't. Not one scripture says King Saul is in heaven right now. You just lied. Two, Jesus said if you believe on him you will never hunger and you will never thirst. That's a one-time thing. John 6 35. Not true. John 6 35 and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 4 13-14 Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 6 35 And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. In these two passages did Jesus mean what he said? If so, do you really believe that we shall never hunger or thirst in this lifetime because we have eternal life? Read these, Matthew 5 6 Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Luke 6 21 Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus said we'll never thirst or hunger? If we have eternal life right now, which means we would never hunger or thirst, then Jesus clearly contradicted himself. However if we don't have eternal life now in this lifetime, that means we still hunger and thirst because we're told to. Answer to hunger and thirst passages, Revelation 7 14-17 And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
This passage in Revelation confirms the scripture fact that what Jesus meant was in the end. He never promised to take away our thirst or hunger or give us eternal life now in this lifetime. But you say, he didn't say in the end you'll never thirst or hunger. Does he really have to say that when he told John to write that in Revelation? This is why simple logical sense can help you understand a passage and make sense of it. Because that's how the Holy Spirit works. Matt said, getting to heaven has never been about our ability to endure and keep our salvation. It's about his ability to keep us saved and secured in his hand. Now it is true that without Christ we can do nothing and it's also true that within ourselves our own ability we cannot please God because that would be going according to our sinful fallen flesh. However, Matt is asserting from that statement that nothing that we do whatsoever accumulates in during or keeping our salvation. That is a lie because it's not true in Scripture. Scripture refutes his fallacious conclusion. Matthew 19 16-17, 26 and, Behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do, that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. But Jesus beheld them, and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Philippians 4 13 I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Is Jesus God? Yes. Therefore comparing Scripture with Scripture with man within themselves it is impossible to keep the commandments to get eternal life. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, which includes keeping the commandments to get eternal life, which is also equivalent to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. John 3:16 for example truly believing on Christ requires two things first believing his identity he is the son of god and god the son in colossians chapter 1 he is the image of the invisible god second you believe what he said and taught which would also include his fulfillment in his death burial and resurrection in fulfilling the levitical priesthood can i keep the commandments through christ to get eternal life which is believing on him yes matt powell doesn't know the scripture very well it's not about our enduring? Jesus said otherwise. Matthew 10 22 And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. It's not about keeping our salvation? The Apostle Paul wrote otherwise. Philippians 2 12-13 Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Is he telling God to work our salvation? No. He is telling us, the saints, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Why with fear and trembling? Again, Jesus answers this question. Matthew 10 28 And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who is he talking to? His apostles who he appointed. Therefore he's telling his believing apostles to fear God that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why would he tell them that if they have nothing to worry about and they have eternal security? That makes no sense. That's like a mother telling her child to fear the parent who is able to destroy their room and residency in the house. If he had unconditional love and acceptance by his mother no matter what he did or said, why would she tell him that? He has nothing to worry about. Matt said, he said it's finished. Here's the passage he failed to provide correctly. John 19:30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. The context is him dying on the cross. What did his death fulfill? Paying for our sins on the cross? No. Jesus never paid for anything, nor does Scripture teach such a nonsensical idea. Instead biblically his death accomplished fulfilling the Levitical priesthood as the perfect eternal satisfying sacrifice. No more need for the sacrificial system because he fulfilled that. His mission, life, and obedience in death was fulfilled. However his death would mean nothing without his resurrection. See 1 Corinthians 15. So his death by itself only accomplished fulfilling the perfect eternal sacrifice. Nothing more, nothing less. People read into his death and think his death accomplished everything on the cross. That's a lie. Overzealous religious airheads like Matt Powell preach a lot of verses, but don't use facts, context, and logical sense to properly explain it. He further says, Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. That's a lie. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach or say that Jesus paid for anything. Observe the following facts. 1. Jesus finished the work the Father gave him to do, John 17 4. 2. He said it is finished, John 19 30, because his work on earth was done. 3. He didn't pay for our sins. He fulfilled the law, Levitical priesthood, see, Matthew 5 17-19, 1 
Hebrews 5-10. 4. Christ didn't pay for anything. When we believe on Him, who He is and what He said, He forgives our sin past debt. Doesn't pay for it. 5. Every time the words paid, pay, and payment are found in the New Testament it involves money. Did God write a check to pay for our sins? No. 6. If He forgave all our sins or paid for sins with a check, then our salvation could be bought with money and His resurrection wouldn't be necessary. That's blasphemy. He did not pay for anything on the cross. Lastly these passages He provided. Ecclesiastes 7:20. For there is not a just man upon earth, that doeth good, and sinneth not. This is true. However it does not mean we can't keep God's law through Christ. As the passages I already provided, we can do all things through Christ, which includes keeping the commandments to get eternal life. 1 Corinthians 10 12 Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You should apply this to you Matt. You should take heed because you're preaching a false gospel and false doctrine. Romans 10 13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This verse people use to imply that all you have to do is call upon Him in some sort of sorcery magic spell sinner's prayer, and at that moment you have eternal life. That's a lie. What are you calling upon Him for? What does it really mean to call upon Him? Does it mean saying magic spell sinner's prayer? No. You're calling upon Him to confess the fact that you're a sinner because you broke His law, 1 John 3 4. Second you believe who Jesus is and what He fulfilled in His death, burial, and resurrection. Lastly, you reap in of your sin of the law you broke. You turn from that and turn unto Christ for His forgiveness of your past sin. After that you are a new creature walking in newness of life to believe on Christ and keep His law holy through Christ. That's what you're calling upon Him for. Now the rest of the verse says, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Hell? No because you can't be saved from a place you have never been. Saved from sin? No because you still have a sinful nature. Am I saved from the second spiritual death? No because you have to endure unto the end and finish your faith in Christ. You are saved from your past sinful life. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 is all about. Titus 1 2 in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. If it's a hope of eternal life, then it hasn't happened yet. Paul explains that in Romans, 8 23 and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. If we're waiting for the redemption of our body, then obviously we don't have our new bodies yet. Having our new bodies is linked to eternal life. If we had eternal life right now, we would never die a physical death. 824-25 For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Wow, so obvious in this simple explanation. Do we see eternal life happening right now? No. So obviously we have to wait patiently for it. Imagine that, the word, patience, is here. Remember Romans 2 7? To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, finally we are finished. It's very easy to refute these false conclusions from Matt Powell and other false teachers. If anybody should be upset, it should be Matt. Because not only did I easily refute him, but also exposed him for the false gospel preaching heretic that he is. He is not part of the body of Christ. If he does not get his head straight about the biblical gospel and keep God's law holy unto the end, he will die in his sin and go straight to hell. Thank you.